Okay, so I think it's 4 p.m. and it's time to start. So welcome everyone. Uh, today is uh, the European Membrane Society's um, seminar series and uh, we hold this every first Wednesday of each uh, month. And today the speaker is uh, Mike uh, Tepper. He received the best paper award from the EMS and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Mike briefly. So he studied uh, mechanical and chemical process engineering at uh, Aachen. And from the very beginning of his uh, career, he focused on hollow fiber membranes. He also spent some time at uh, Monash University in Australia, and later on decided to do a PhD with uh, Professor Matthias uh, Westling uh, back at uh, Aachen. And uh, the paper that he's presenting today um, is about uh, rotation in a spinneret produces helical rich membranes for mass transfer enhancement. So, Mike, the stage is yours. Okay, <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, a warm welcome also from my side um, to today's EMS webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Tepper. And uh, very uh, thank you very much for this kind of introduction, Georgie. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited and thankful uh, for the invitation, and it's a great honor and pleasure to, that I can today present uh, to you our work about helical rich membranes. So throughout the talk, I, I will show you, uh, introduce you to the design and manufacture of such a rotating microstructured spinneret. Um, I will also then show you how the spinner is capable of producing helical rich membranes. Uh, and, yeah, and essentially, I will show you what helical rich membranes are. And then lastly, I will introduce you to what they are good for. Um, and here I will start with an ultrafiltration study that was also presented in the paper. Um, and, but I will also come to our latest results on the application of such membranes um, in for gas liquid membrane contactors. So no, okay, now it's working. Um, so yeah, uh, Georgie already did an introduction, but very quickly, as you already said, I studied mechanical en and chemical engineering at RWTH Aachen University. So then I went abroad to Matthew Hill's group where I worked on gas separation membranes. Uh, and these were anti-aging PTMSP thin film composite membranes. I went back to Aachen for my PhD thesis in Matthias Wessling's group. And here I worked on rotation in a spinneret. Uh, and there, what I did there is I, where we developed, or I developed um, a spinneret platform technology uh, that aimed to introduce turbulence promoting structures on the inside of hollow fiber membranes. And with that, we, just, uh, we developed two membrane architectures, and I will talk about uh, the helical rich membrane architecture today. Well, but now, uh, move to industry. I work now as a product developer in healthcare, uh, yeah, developing membrane base. Products. Well, uh, in this slide here, it shows you some twisted logos. And actually, these twisted logos are a taste of uh, what my goal is today. So, my goal is today uh, that I want to convince you that geometry matters. And for instance, geometry matters um, in membrane applications, such as filtration. <clears throat> so, in this sketch here, we see a hollow fiber membrane in cross section, so with the two walls, and this hollow fiber membrane consists of a certain material, uh, and within that material, there are pores. Now, when we want to use this membrane for filtration, typically one component can pass that membrane and another component is retained by the membrane. Now, there was incredible work uh, on membranes, especially with a focus on increasing the permeability of the material, and with that, more components can pass through the membrane uh, per time. But that also means that we transport more of the retained component towards the surface of the membrane. And with that, uh, a new bound, uh, this boundary layer here builds up, and that boundary layer, then it increases the resistance to flow. Uh, and that was before reduced by enhancing the permeability. Uh, so the question of my research is always really um, about how to reduce this boundary layer in order to, again, reduce the, re the resistance for fluid flow through the membrane. And one of the main reasons why these boundary layers, or we also call this concentration polarization, 
one of the reasons why this happens is the flow profile in a tube. Uh, and typically, membranes are applied at laminar flow conditions. So from our base studies, we know that in a tube at laminar flow conditions, a parabolic flow profile will develop. So meaning there's a very high flow, fluid flow velocity in the center of the fiber and no velocity at the surface of the membrane. Uh, and with that correlated is also that the shear uh, is low at the surface of the membrane. So the, so the task for me is now to, and the idea is to flatten this curve in order to enhance um, the uh, enhance and increase the liquid flow velocity at the surface with a, of the membrane, and with that to increase the shear. Uh, and we want to do this, for instance, with a helical rich membrane. So what is this helical rich membrane? On the outside, this membrane looks as you know it, hollow fibers. So it's round. But the trick is now on the inside, uh, where we can either have uh, a straight ridge or we can have a ridge that goes helically along the length of the fiber. Uh, and with that ridge now, when we apply a fluid flow, we can really, or we think that we can really deflect the fluid flow. And by this deflection, initiate a secondary flow um, that causes turbulence promotion to reduce uh, this upcoming boundary layer. Um, when I talk about membranes today, I always talk about polymeric membranes, and then the first section of this talk about polyether sulfur membranes. Um, and these membranes here, uh, we produce with a dry jet wet spinning technique. So what does that mean? So the initial polymer material, we, we dissolve this in a suitable organic solvent. Um, that in the next step, we extrude through a spinneret, let it pass through an air gap, and eventually uh, immerse it into a coagulation bath. Then we, uh, then in the end of the of the system, we, for instance, collect it on a drum. Well, when zooming in uh, in this section here uh, and looking at the spinneret, we see that we don't just extrude one but two two solutions at the same time. So we have the polymer solution that contains the actual membrane material, but also in the center we apply a ball solution which has multiple functions where the two main functions are that it just keeps the fiber open and, and creates the ball in the middle, uh, but also by the, uh, with the chemistry of this ball solution, we can tailor functions of the membrane. Well, and eventually the membrane formation here happens by phase inversion, which means the mutual exchange by diffusion of solvent uh, from the polymer solution with one solvent of the precipitation bath, but also of the ball solution. So looking to, uh, at the spinneret, typically hollow fiber membrane spinnerets are made of machine steel. And when we now zoom into the, uh, at the orifice, we can see that typically here we have round geometries. So the round bore needle, also there's a round gap around that you can see here. Uh, and with that orifice geometry, we can uh, produce perfectly round hollow fiber membranes. But we want to create a ridge. Uh, so uh, when looking at the literature here, the first one creating ridges on the inside of hollow fibers uh, was one of the first ones was Zeynep Trufas Emigen. She had a, a she was capable of um, producing straight ridges. And that is essentially done by um, equipping this bore needle with a groove so that this groove acts as a template uh, for, for the microstructure, for the ridge. And here, and this was uh, in Zeynep's work still done with steel spinnerets. What we employed is a 3D printing technique for manufacturing the spinnerets so that we can, uh, on the one hand side, um, create spinnerets very fast and flexible, uh, very fast and cheap, but also flexible in the sense that 3D printing is a free forming, uh, free forming technique so that we can make um, unconventional geometries, for instance. Well, and throughout the last years, uh, with focusing on spinneret manufacture, we have tested very many, many different um, 3D printing 3D printers, tested different 3D printing materials. And with that, we really built a library and a heuristic uh, so that we know what we need to choose for spinneret manufacture in order to have a, a good design, a high surface quality, but also a high chemical stability because, well, the solvents used, the organic solvents are typically very harsh. Well, this uh, on the side of uh, spinneret manufacture. Um, as I said, 
it's a free from tech, uh, technology. So uh, in, the, in the early beginning of our study, we tried uh, different um, we tried different groove shapes just to see what the influence is on the uh, rich formation. So for instance, we had uh, this rectangular design, a triangular design, or also uh, or a round design. And we also played around with a number of the ridges. And here in the beginning of the study, we didn't really see a large impact of the groove shape uh, on the shape of the ridge. So we just continued throughout our work with this rectangular structure because we considered this most stable and most easy to manufacture. So uh, having now a spinner at hand with such a microstructure, we were also capable uh, that you just need to believe me uh, at this moment, we were capable of um, yeah, producing hollow fibers with straight ridges. Well, but this was not enough for us. We, as I said, wanted to go from straight to helical uh, because this helical ridge gives us the capability of having a high impact uh, on the secondary flow introduction. So because of that, uh, we were missing something. We were missing, uh, what we were missing uh, was the rotation in the spinneret because we here conceptualize that with this rotation, uh, we can uh, yeah, rotate and twist the ridge from straight to helical. So there's a reason, uh, one of the reasons why my predecessor Tobias Löw started on to, uh, the design and the uh, engineering of a rotating spinneret. So here, this is the spinneret uh, and this can rotate entirely. So I'm looking at this video. So we have the spinneret that rotates completely. The spinneret needs a bit more design, so it goes into a bushing so that we can mount uh, the spinneret. Then this bushing um, is connected with a cup to a motor because, I mean, we need to uh, bring motion to it. And then to separate the different fluid four parts, we have radial shaft seals, but also spaces in between to keep it in position. We need to mount the whole thing with radial bearings um, so yeah, that it can rotate, uh, screw this together, and then eventually have this whole thing into a housing because it's housing now gives us the capability to connect the spinneret to a polymer solution and a ball solution, uh, but also mount this um, yeah, on our spinning line. And, and this was the early beginning that worked very well. But we also saw some constraints um, in the production of the fiber. So we also went a step back um, to see and really, really think what is the what are the initial, uh, what are the main, uh, the base, the base conditions that we need to fulfill in order to have rotation in the spinneret? Um, so we went back to this gray model here, and there we uh, thought, well, of course, we need to introduce the polymer solution for the introducing the membrane material. We also need to introduce a ball solution uh, to keep open the fiber. Um, then next, as we can't rotate the whole spinning line, we need uh, some decoupling of rotation um, between the spinneret and the environment. And this can, for instance, be done by rotation coupling. But we also uh, need a sealing function at some point to um, fluidically decouple environment uh, from the spinneret. Well, and lastly, uh, we need to uh, put motion to the system. So from this gray model, then, we came to our uh, uh, yeah, new spinner, spinneret design that we call rotational spinneret because now not the entire spinneret rotates uh, anymore, but just the bore needle, which is enough for the example of the helical rich membrane where we essentially just need the rotation on the inside. Um, yeah. So here in this design, we have we have a motor that is connected to a gearbox, which then translates the rotation into the spinneret. Here in the back, we have a bore solution at a rotation ceiling, uh, rotation coupling, uh, and we have here the inlet for the polymer solution. And when zooming at the uh, orifice, uh, we can see our uh, rotating microstructured needle that is, for instance, mounted in a ball bearing. Now, how, the, how does this look like uh, in action? So here I have this rendering. So now, uh, Turning this on, we can see that on the inside, uh, the microstructured needle rotates uh, in order to twist the ridge. And when we zoom out again and remove the cap um, from this device, 
then we also see some first additional components um, as for instance, the ball bearing, but also here this static ceiling. Uh, however, as I showed, there are also rotation ceilings that are further in the back of this design. So until now, I've shown you many concepts, many ideas, renderings, uh, but uh, haven't shown that it really works. And for that, the next video shows you that it works. And I give you uh, a second with it. So here what we see is really the heli curvature uh, membrane developing. So at the top, we have the uh, rotation, the, the rotating uh, spinneret device, and the white thing that you see, that is actually the rotating needle. And from here, we see um, a jet of polymer solution that um, is transparent at the outlet of the spinneret and becomes more and more cloudy. And this increase in cloudiness is really um, the, uh, the pathway uh, of precipitation that you can see, because this is typically, um, we typically start with transparent solution and the further uh, the solution progresses in precipitation, um, the more cloudy it gets. So really you can see here the membrane forming. And especially this increase in cloudiness is also uh, what makes us see the ridge itself developing because here this fine uh, white line that you see, um, that is actually the ridge. And we see it so well because the ridge has a higher surface to volume ratio. Uh, and that is the reason why it just precipitates faster as the rest of the fiber. Yeah, so here we can really see the fiber developing. And then the result can look somewhere like this. So we have the round outside and on the inside, the helical ridges, which can be overlapping, uh, and they sometimes also touch, but they are not connected. So in this example, they are deconnected, they just touch, um, but they also can be shorter, as in this case, where they do not overlap. And this already leads us into a bit more detailed uh, understanding and uh, results about the geometry of the fiber. So in this example, this membrane here was uh, fabricated at a rotation speed of 290 revolutions per minute. Uh, and with that, we get this elongated ridge shape where the ridges overlap. However, now going down uh, in rotation speed, so 210 RPM, for instance, and zero, we can see that the ridge length decreases. And this is something that we uh, observed over all experiments, that the ridge becomes longer the faster uh, the uh, spinner rotates. Uh, well, but we are not just uh, interested in the ridge uh, length. We are especially interested in the pitch of the ridge because uh, we, where the ridge pitch means uh, the length that the ridge needs for one full rotation. So here we have one full rotation. Um, and this is especially interesting for us because uh, we would assume and hypothesize um, that the smaller this pitch, uh, the stronger the influence uh, on the fluid flow is. And with that, the stronger the potential uh, increase in turbulence promotion and mass transfer enhancement. So on this graph here, I've plotted the ridge pitch over rotation speed. And when looking at the results from the rotate, entirely rotating spinneret, we can see a decrease in pitch or with increasing rotation speed. And that is exactly what we would expect from theory. Um, and we also can look at, um, uh, at some exam samples from the rotating needle and we see the same behavior. What we also see is uh, that we can go towards higher rotation speed. And that is, for instance, also one of the advantages that we have with a rotating needle, that we can go to higher um, rotation speeds uh, with that smaller ridge pitches as uh, compared to the initial design where the entire spin ridge rotates. Yeah, and this all uh, holds very well to the calculation, um, so there's no significant difference. Um, when we did this me these membranes uh, in the beginning, uh, we, and we wanted to, to, uh, to, to challenge them for the real influence, and we always wanted to challenge them in an ultrafiltration study, we had the large drawback that when uh, we want to use it for ultrafiltration, we need to have the feet on the inside, because this is where the boundary layer development happens. So that also means for the membrane that this is the position where the selective skin needs to be. Uh, but in such membranes, we have a, a pore size here at the surface in a micrometer range. 
and this would not be suitable for um, yeah, ultra filtration. So we had to uh, invest a lot of work on getting this skin tighter and by uh, adding more precipitant, more water to the bore solution, which was not very, uh, very trivial uh, because of the rotation, um, we could in the end uh, get, um, get, a, get a skin layer on the inside uh, that, is, that, made, uh, that gave us suitable um, membranes with suitable separation characteristics uh, for the ultrafiltration study. Well, and this is now how this study looked like. Um, so in the study, we had a um, we, we uh, had a gelatin uh, gelatin model. So we uh, and yeah, the method that we applied uh, we called a feed stepping method at constant flux. So what is that? Uh, this graph here it shows the liquid flow over time, uh, and what we did in, uh, as a method is that. For the feed liquid flow, we had a constant um, flow velocity uh, over 55 cycles. At the same time, we had a constant liquid flow for the permeate. So it means uh, we operated at constant flux. And also one full cycle is always the combination of the filtration uh, and the backwash phase. Um, so the backwash also we had at a constant liquid flow rate. Uh, and then going to the to the main part uh, of this method, the feed stepping. So in the feed stepping section, uh, we still had a constant uh, liquid flow for permeate and for backwash, but we were stepping the feed flow velocity. So we were going here from high feed flow velocity to low uh, velocity and then to high again. Uh, and why we did that is the following. So what we investigated is the response of the transmembrane pressure. Uh, that was our uh, indicator for what happens in terms of in terms of boundary layer formation uh, or disruption of this boundary layer. So what we uh, again would uh, hypothesize is that in the beginning, uh, well, let's say let's start at a, at a single filtration step. So we we hypothesize that at a thing, single filtration step would have an increase in the transmembrane pressure because of the buildup of boundary layer, but also uh, over the 50, uh, over the constant feed 55 cycles, we expected an increase in the overall level. And that is just because of initial um, uh, phenomena happening that lead to uh, irreversible fouling effects. So with that, so in that sense, this first phase here has the intention to, to be some kind of a running in phase, so that after that the the membrane is more or less, let's say, in a steady state condition. Because uh, we wanted to go into the feed stepping with a steady state condition. And the response that we expected now in feed stepping is that um, with the decrease of the feed uh, flow velocity, we expected an increase in transmembrane pressure because um, uh, the lower we go with the feed flow, the lower we would go uh, in terms of Reynolds number. And that is always um, yeah, the, the first argument um, about um, what happens in terms of fluid flow. Uh, and how strong the boundary layer can develop or is uh, diminished. Uh, now, what we did in terms of really data evaluation um, is that we looked at the single uh, filtration steps. And here we always looked at the TMP gradient um, in the end of a step, because in that phase, really the whole system is run in. It's, uh, it has reached its set uh, control values. So there we can then really evaluate and analyze uh, the data. Yeah, and so this is what we plot here in the following. So here we use such TMP gradient data that we plotted over the feed flow velocity. Um, and we're looking at the results at the TMP gradients from the zero RPM and the 30 RPM fiber, we can see um, that the TMP gradient decreases with an increasing feed flow velocity. And actually, this is exactly what we hypothesize, uh, because as I said, the higher the feed flow velocity, the higher the shear at the surface, the higher the Reynolds number, higher the mixing, um, less boundary layer buildup, and with that, less TMP gradient. Um, yeah, and so when looking now at a, at an increased rotation speed, so decreased ridge pitch, uh, we see 
that the, de that the trend of development of the TMP gradient over the floor velocity is still uh, is, is very similar. So it decreases with increasing through feed flow velocity, but it's at a reduced level. Uh, and so from this reduced level, we can uh, we can say that we have a, a reduced buildup of uh, of boundary layer. And now finally coming to our highest uh, evaluated rotation speed, we can see that the trend is still decreasing, uh, but at the lowest at the lowest level of TMP gradient. So that would mean that here we have the largest impact uh, on fluid flow manipulation and the largest impact uh, of the diminishing uh, of boundary layer formation. And that really uh, of a significant, significant factor of 3.5. So from that we really can say that the helical ridges um, introduce secondary flow for boundary disruption. Well, and this was, uh, let's say, a summary uh, of our key results from the first paper. Well, uh, but you might ask, what happened in the meantime? Um, and sure, in the meantime, we didn't do anything. We continued on it, tried to um, develop it further. Um, and this is what we worked on. So here on this slide, I have, let's say, the main questions that we had um, after this first paper that we try to answer in the following work. Uh, so one of the questions was on how to um, scale up the spinneret in the sense of um, going towards material, going from the 3D printing polymer materials towards materials like steel, so that are permanently uh, stable, uh, but also scale up in the sense to miniaturize the system because essentially uh, the, uh, the smaller the diameter uh, of the fiber can be, but also the smaller uh, all the components of the spinner device can be, um, uh, yeah. the smaller the components, uh, the easier it is to integrate into production, and the smaller the fiber, the higher the, pe the den packing density can be in a hollow fiber membrane module. So this is a part of the question, but also one question was uh, on the versatility of this of this um, production technique. So until now, uh, I, I just talked about polyether sulfone membranes, but we also wanted to try PVDF, so polyvinyldene fluoride, um, as a different material, so we can see whether also different materials work. And essentially, this material, because this is essentially uh, especially known to be to have a bit more uh, challenging um, coagulation characteristics. Um, when talking about membrane preparation. We also wanted to investigate a bit deeper into what happens for fluid flow. So we really want to elucidate uh, the secondary flow introduced by the helical, ridge, by the helical ridges. And that we did uh, with simulation, but also uh, with an experimental investigation. And lastly, we didn't just want to show versatility in materials. We also show, wanted to show uh, that this um, that this membrane can help uh, other applications, as for instance, a gas liquid membrane contactor. And here, especially, uh, we, we wanted to, uh, to realize carbon capture in a gas liquid membrane contactor. Um, so this is uh, conceptually how this looks like. So again, we would have our hollow fiber membrane and carbon capture means, for instance, the removal of carbon dioxide from nitrogen, so being from air. And we would do that with an absorbent. And when we want to know uh, how this process works, we need to look again and to the inside of this fiber. So what happens during this process is that once the CO2 comes in contact with the membrane, it might diffuse through the wall of the membrane and then dissolve <clears throat> in the absorbent, which is in our case, just the eye water. Well, and hopefully this doesn't just happen for one molecule, but for very many. Uh, now, as we have discussed already, uh, in a tube at laminar flow conditions, we would have a laminar flow profile. And this laminar flow profile is, again, the reason why there is concentration polarization, which means very many molecules of CO2 at the surface of the membrane, uh, whereas there's a much lower concentration expected in the bulk. And again, we want to introduce uh, turbulence promotion to enhance uh, the mass transfer here. And so, with respect, uh, respect uh, regarding sorry, regarding um, the scaling up of the spinneret or making this spinneret at all uh, capable of fabricating uh, P 
PVDF membranes. And this is the material. This material is called rigid material. And this material actually was not capable anymore uh, to be used um, for PVDF solutions because we prefer uh, to produce uh, intangible PVDF solutions at elevated temperature as compared to the polyether sulfone. So in that moment, this material was not stable enough anymore. So because of that, uh, we found a different material, which is called a high temperature resin. And that material um, was much more stable at the, uh, at the elevated temperature. And it's overall much more stable in the harsh solvent and in P that we used uh, as compared to the other material. But also we wanted to go to permanently stable materials such as metal. metal. Uh, so we wanted to go to stainless steel. And here we started uh, with milling as manufacturing technique. So especially the milling of the roof here at the tip of the rotating needle. Uh, however, we saw very quickly that the size of this roof was not enough to template the ridge. So because of that, we also were looking at other manufacturing techniques. And there we came to spark eroding uh, and spark eroding uh, allowed us to, to develop um, and design uh, the tip in a very similar shape as compared to the freeform te uh, technique and manufacturing technique of 3D printing. And then with this, um, with this design of the groove of the tip of, of, tip of the microstructure, we're really capable um, to produce a membrane. And here you can see, this is for instance, the PVDF membrane that we produce <clears throat> with the 3D printed rotating needles. However, when going to uh, that stainless steel spark eroded needle, we could still uh, or again uh, produce the helical rich membranes at a lower dimension correlating with a lower dimension um, of that uh, stainless steel needle. Um, yeah, that was the first thing that we wanted to investigate. But I also said that we wanted to look deeper into what happens to fluid flow. And for that, we used a very nice trick that uh, yeah, was enabled by the PVDF. And that trick, we call this index matching. So what does that mean? And typically, uh, as you saw at the slide before, uh, let's go back, membranes are typically white, uh, ultrafiltration membranes white and not transparent. transparent. However, this uh, opaqueness uh, comes from the microporosity of the material. It doesn't come from the material itself. Uh, and that means, uh, once we fill up the pores uh, with a liquid of a very similar refractive index um, as, the as the membrane material itself, we can make um, this uh, combined uh, membrane material and uh, the, the membrane transparent. Uh, and ap apparently octanol has a very similar refractive index uh, as PVDF. So this PVDF swollen membrane in octanol is not transparent. So that means and then we can look into the uh, to the inside of the fiber. Uh, so meaning if in terms of experimental design, where we uh, introduced this membrane into this uh, chamber here where we have a window and then into the membrane, we introduce a DI water flow as a background liquid flow, but also we introduced the dye as a tracer with a needle on the inside of this fiber. So what we now then with the camera want to uh, investigate on is that when we introduce structures into our hollow fiber. We want to introduce um, yeah, the influence of this microstructure uh, on the uh, manipulation of fluid flow. And here are the results. Um, so at first, we look at a zero RPM fiber. And apparently, here, this is uh, the example. And this is one also one significant uh, difference from the PVDF membrane formation as compared to polyether sulfone membrane formation. <clears throat> There are some, uh, the rules apply a bit differently. Uh, and that, for instance, means that for zero RPM, uh, maybe you remember back for the polyethosophone, we had very short ridges. However, when we look into the PVDF membrane, we have no ridges at all at zero RPM. So we just have a round inner shape. And so here you see, as I said, you see the results. So we have this transparent hollow fiber membrane and there's the needle. And from this needle, we see this um, die trajectory. And as we would have expected from textbook, we see a straight line without any significant radial dispersion of the die or anything else. So this really would mean this is uh, how we would expect laminar flow to look like. Now looking at a membrane fabricated at 150 RPM, 
Here for the PVDF, we get such kind of a bump shape ridge. So, um, yeah. And this bump shape ridge, again, it doesn't, in this case, doesn't cause too much um, flow manipulation because, again, we can see that we have more or less a straight die trajectory uh, uh, without significant dispersion of the die. Now this all changes when going to higher rotation speeds, as for instance, 200 RPM. Because for the two, starting with the 200 RPM, the ridge shape develops from this bump shape to a more elongated and spiky shape. And this shape now has an impact on fluid flow manipulation. And that you see very early on uh, at the outlet of the, uh, of the needle, because here you already see, let's say, a widening uh, of this die trajectory. Also here in this section, you see an initial rotation of this um, widened die trajectory. But as soon um, as this uh, yeah, die tracer hits a ridge, it gets deflected completely. And with this deflection, then very uh, quickly, also there's an entire dispersion um, of the dye uh, in the whole fluid uh, on the lumen side of the membrane. And this becomes even more pronounced going towards higher rotation speeds and smaller pitches where um, the redirection of the flow happens quite early on, just as uh, the dispersion of the dye. So with that, we can really see that we have an introduction of secondary flow by the helical ridge. I said that we also investigated it um, in CFD simulation. Um, so here in this simulation study, we looked at 0 RPM, 150 RPM, 200 RPM, so meaning no ridge at all, a bump-shaped ridge, and this elongated spiky ridge. Uh, and, just, yeah, for, and, and when we look at the radial flow velocity uh, for no ridge at all, we can see no uh, radial flow velocities. Looking at the bump ridge, we see initial radi uh, radial flow. However, here the maximum flow velocity is in a range of 0.4 meters per second. Uh, and you, for that, you need the information that the inlet velocity um, is 0.6 meters per second. So uh, compared to the inlet velocity, this is not very high. However, here for the spiky ridge, uh, we have a maximum radial flow velocity um, in the in the magnitude of uh, of a third of the inlet flow velocity. So we really, from that, can say that we have uh, a significant radial flow and partially redirection of the main fluid flow velocity. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this for the radial flow velocity. And now looking at the shear stress, we can also see that we have increased shear stress for the 150 RPM in the vicinity of the ridge. Uh, where else for the 200 RPM, we have uh, strongly increased shear at the surface, more or less over the entire circumference of the lumen surface. When at last, even looking at this plot, which shows a streamlined velocity field for the 150 RPM, so the bumpy ridge, we see a small deflection and a tilted angle um, uh, for, for the flow against the main flow uh, direction. And however, for the 250 RPM, so the elongated ridge, we really see a redirection uh, of the main flow. So meaning um, the evolution of a rotational flow uh, that yeah, would be expected uh, and also be confirmed by the die to have a much higher impact on fluid flow manipulation uh, and mass transfer enhancement. Yeah. So from there, I come to the last part. Now the application as a gas liquid monitoring contactor that I already talked about. So our, this is how our experiment looked like. So we had a DI water reservoir. So DI water as the absorbent. Uh, we pumped this absorbent through the lumen of the hollow fiber membranes, and then eventually collected it in a bath. Uh, in counter current flow, we had a sweep gas that contained 10% CO2 and nitrogen, so that here we could measure the outlet uh, concentration of CO2 to measure the difference between inlet and outlet. And as I said, here we use uh, microporous PVDF membranes, which are hydrophobic. So that means that the gas phase would be inside the porosity of the membrane wall, whereas the water just uh, contacts <clears throat> the surface. And this is the configuration 
that you, you typically want to have for a gas liquid membrane contactor with porous membranes, because with that, diffusivity, diffusivity in the gas phase is much higher uh, as compared to the gas diffusivity in the water. So this would overall mean uh, the, the lowest total resistance to uh, permeate to transmembrane uh, transfer, transfer of components, uh, but it also means the development of the boundary layer, the concentration polarization here um, at the interface between um, gas and water. Well, again, these are the results. So here I have the carbon dioxide flux plotted over liquid flow velocity. And when starting with a zero RPM fiber, so the round geometry on the inside, we see what we probably would expect. We see an increase in carbon dioxide flux over liquid flow velocity. And that's similar as uh, before, the higher the fluid flow, the higher the potential shear and mixing. Um, so that fits to our assumptions. Looking at results for zero, uh, 75 and 150 RPM, so remember bump shape bridge, um, we see a carbon transmembrane carbon dioxide flux <clears throat> in a very similar magnitude uh, as compared to the zero RPM. But now this also changes uh, with the elongation and the spikiness of the ridge. So for the 200 RPM, um, we see an increase in carbon dioxide flux with, a, uh, with an increased uh, development in the beginning, but overall with an increased level. And this increase in level, um, there is actually a very strict, a strict hierarchy between the um, uh, extent of carbon dioxide flux uh, being correlated to the rotation speed of the membrane. So again, we can really see that the helical ridge increases the mass transfer um, and that there's a direct correlation between the rotation speed of the spinneret, so meaning the uh, final uh, pitch of the ridge uh, with the extent and the impact of increasing the mass transfer. And that actually can amount up to, uh, or can end up uh, in an up to tenfold increase of the transmembrane carbon dioxide flux. So here, uh, people often ask me, uh, well, uh, this, is, this is good. This is nice to see that you can increase the mass transfer, but what about, uh, what about the pressure drop? And, and this, is, this is an excellent and relevant question because sure, if you want to in, uh, introduce mixing, you need to invest something. And what you need to invest is energy. And this energy essentially is expressed fluidically by the pressure drop over the length of the fiber. Um, so because of that, uh, I have this uh, very basic uh, calculation here where I want to investigate now um, the specific energy that is consumed um, per transmembrane, uh, trans yeah, per, per a transported molecule of CO2 uh, over the membrane. And this energy consumption that basically relates on the pressure drop, so meaning the energy that needs to be invested into the pump. And what we see here for the zero RPM fiber, so first for a zero RPM fiber as produced by the 3D printed needle compared to the uh, fiber prepared by the spark eroded needle, so meaning a large inner, large inner diameter, smaller inner diameter, we see this increase uh, that for an increasing carbon dioxide flux, <clears throat> the specific energy amount consumed also increases. Uh, yeah. And this looks now a bit different uh, for um, the, mem the membrane types with the helical ridges. So when comparing the 450 RPM with 3D printed needles against the zero, uh, 850 RPM for spark eroding needles, the rotation speeds are very different, but actually the ridge pitch is very similar because here for the high rotation speed, we also increased the draw ratio of the fiber. So meaning that the final ridge pitch is quite similar. We could see that we have, especially um, in, the, in the beginning here, at a, at a high, at a much increased carbon dioxide flux as compared to zero RPM, uh, a low specific energy consumption, and that the increase in consumed energy um, kicks in at a later point uh, at yeah, enhanced carbon dioxide flux. So again, we can really say that we, on the one hand, have a mass transfer and the enhancement, but in parallel, we can also uh, operate the system at lower energy consumption, 
uh, with the enhanced mass transfer, which is obviously important for applications. And with, an, with that, I want to quickly summarize uh, what I talked about today. So I started uh, introducing our rotation in the spin rate concept. So we introduced it to the design and the manufacture um, of such a spin rate device. After that, I showed you how we use this device um, to produce helical rich membranes from polyether cell foam, but also from PVDF. Uh, and it gives the system uh, its very own formation and shaping characteristics, let's say. And then in the end, I showed you what such fibers are good for, and they're good for enhancing mass transfer um, at a reduced energy cost. Well, and with that, I want to thank uh, very many people here on this slide. There are very many names of former students, colleagues, friends, professors. Uh, and without you, it would definitely have not been possible for me to give this talk today because probably most of this work would not have been done. So thank you for your support and gaining momentum. Thank you for your trust along the way. Uh, and yeah, <clears throat> thank you all for listening. Um, but I think we still have some time for question and answers. So uh, feel free to ask now. Otherwise here, many opportunities to get in touch after. And of course, also to EMS, thank you also for giving me the opportunity today to share uh, uh, this work and uh, with with all of you. So yeah, thanks. Mike, thank you very much for the very nice presentation and congratulations again for your award. Uh, I'm pretty sure there will be questions. So please unmute uh, yourself and then you can ask uh, questions. or I'm going to check if you have any questions on the chat. Okay, so in the meantime, maybe I start with my question, if you yes. don't mind. Um, so I was wondering, how can you actually predict how the geometry will affect the performance? So how can you rationally design these uh, spinnerets to get the performance enhancement that you want? Okay, yeah, so this is an yeah, excellent question. Um, so honestly, initially, we're, I think our prediction, predictions were not, were not too good. Initially, we wanted to to look more, let's say, at the um, yeah, look look at the fabrication side to just find out what is what 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 is possible to fabricate. Uh, what is let's say what what are, what are the boundary conditions? How how slow can we go in terms uh, with a rich pitch and stuff like that? Uh, and uh, in that sense, what we now learned from this, let's say, from evaluating some of the boundary conditions, we learned that um, uh, as I showed on one side um, that we that the rich pitch more or less directly correlates with the rotation speed or the combination of rotation speed and draw speed. So uh, let's say having this knowledge uh, at hand, we can now really say that um, uh, if we, we, when we look at the at, at a, at an, at a process, at the application, we see how strong um, is, is the boundary layer effect. We can now say, okay, maybe, maybe with, with the help of the simulation, we would need this and that uh, extent of secondary flow then let's say we can come back to the fabrication and, and set the parameters. I would say that this would might this might be a process on yeah making their prediction and, and setting the membrane to 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 the specific requirement. I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how sensitive is the uh, the preparation of these spinnerets? So can you precisely reproduce and at what level or what kind of uh, precision do you have there? Um, yeah, so that that I would say depends very much on the manufacturing process. Um, so as you, as you saw, especially for the 3D printed parts, um, they are quite large, uh, and also the tolerance in 3D printing it's it's not it's not very good. Um, however, as as the overall geometry was quite large, the fluctuation on the resulting membrane was not too big. Now the, I guess this becomes more of an issue 
from going towards towards the mini miniaturization of the system, but especially with this um, with the with the manufacturing techniques, as for instance um, the the spark eroding that I talked about, there you can manufacture very precisely. Um, so in that sense, you do not have fluctuations on the equipment of the spinner equipment. Um, then the fluctuation uh, would be the fluctuations that you have on the extrusion uh, side in mm -hmm. your spinning line. That is probably the fluctuation that we are used to traditionally from man membrane manufacturers. All right, thank you. Um, Welcome. Okay, any questions on the chat? No. Okay, any questions from the audience? I hope I was not too confusing so that no one can ask a question. Yeah, probably the opposite, then it was too clear. Well, that would be good. <laughs> no, no questions uh, remain. That would make me happy. Okay, so if no more questions, then I think we can uh, close the seminar. Sure. And I just have sure. one final question for you. So what does it mean to uh, to get the best paper award from the EMS? Can you talk a little bit about that? What does it mean? Yeah, good question. What does it mean? Uh, I think, first of all, I mean, it's a, first of all, I feel flattened about it. I mean, it's a, it's a great recognition uh, of our work. It, 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 it shows that people are interested. And I mean, when you are, as a PhD student, Sitting in the lab alone in the night, I don't know. No one, no one, no one sees what you do. You you don't really know. Does it have an impact? Does it make a difference or not? And I think in that sense, just for me personal, I mean, it's a great recognition um, on, the, on my personal side. And on this side, let's say externally going to the to the to the to the world, I mean, it's a great. I guess it's a great advertisement. I mean, I let's say I I, I always had a bright burning flame for my work. So I wanted to know as many people. Uh, so, so I wanted that many as many people as possible know about it. And I mean, if you just publish the paper, sure it is there, but people need to find it. I think this now also, especially inviting me to this webinar, it just gives also the opportunity to just increase the impact in terms of telling more people uh, about telling more people about it, reaching more people, but also expanding uh, let's say the format. Uh, I mean, people now here can listen and watch, and in that sense, I also, uh, yeah, respect it as a great possibility to increase the impact, uh, yeah, and just to to reach more people. So that's also, I think, something that I like. Yeah, so dissemination and also uh, getting appreciation. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Very lucky. It was just not happy uh, it was such, it's, it's for such a pity that i was not at the human membrane so that i could receive it personally but still i had a great conveyor yes and thank you for being here today and giving the seminar we really appreciate it thank you okay so some final uh, slides okay so announcements um also dr taki received the best paper award from ems and he will give a seminar on the 5th of uh, July, so please uh, do attend it. And the deadline for the next uh, Best Paper Award uh, competition is the 28th of June. So mark your calendar and submit your uh, nominations, please. Okay, and don't forget that we have an EMS job offer uh, website, so you can either advertise your uh, job offers if you have any or if you're looking for jobs then don't forget to uh, to look at the EMS uh, website or contact us uh, directly okay so thank you very much for everyone for attending this uh, seminar and i see you uh, in july thanks bye